Well, welcome back to the channel. Now, today we're going to do something a little bit different. We're obviously not in the studio. We're in my shop where I build all kinds of things, including DIT kits. Now, this one in particular, it's in the shop to get an overhaul, to get a little maintenance. It's kind of battle-worn from being on the road for a couple of years, needs software upgrades and a few fixes. And while it's here, we need to take a look at this because this kit is really kind of special. Well, if you've had a chance to get the digital imaging textbook and look it over, you'll notice that there's quite a number of chapters in here that are on um, things you th should think about when you build a DIT kit and um, selecting software. All right, it, it's a chunk of this book because it's a pretty important decision. So the considerations for this particular kit by the DIT was that it wasn't supposed to be a do-all kit. It was going to be very specific to one job task, and that's the data manager. In other words, the person that offloads those digital cards from the cameras and backs up the data using checksumming software. That's really all this kit is set up to do. Well, it can do another thing as well while it's backing up. It needed to have the function to back up not only to hard drives or a drive array, but it also needed to back up to LTO tape. And that is a wrinkle that really drove some of the decisions in making this kit. So we know that to back up data, we don't need a super expensive and a super high performance graphics card because the processing and the moving of files is really done through the CPU and not a GPU. So that allows us to have maybe a little less expensive computer. We're not, con we're not worried about the graphics side of it. We're not worried about backing up files, although we do need to drive a monitor to see what we're doing. Needs to be able to handle the software that we've chosen. But the issue with the LTO tape is kind of a wrinkle that, that, that really needed to be worked out. Because the LTO tape machine is driven by a card, a special interconnect card, that has to go into a computer. Now, having a card um, in a Mac-based environment becomes a bit of a problem. You can't put them in your laptops, and uh, really, the only ones that you can really dump a card into are the Mac Pros, either the older ones or, of course, the new very expensive ones. The LTO machines uh, have a special connector on the end of it that's not commonly used by the average person with a computer. Now you gotta understand LTO tapes came out of the data center uh, environment and these guys have a whole different connector scheme and a whole different goal that they're trying to do and so there are connectors and cables and, and formats that are very specific to data centers but we can move those into our realm as well. So therein lies a decision on how we are going to get this to work with an LTO tape in a Mac environment. So another wrinkle in the decision-making process. All right, so how did we solve that? But before we lift up the hood and see what's inside the box, let's talk about the box itself, right? This is a repurposed roadie box. It is actually meant for audio mixers, the mixing consoles. So if you look these up online for a mixer console roadie box or travel box, you're going to find this design. And so what it was set up to do is that this lid comes off and inside of here is a mixing console. And then the back area here comes off and we can plug in all of our mic cables and various input cables on the box. And then the front comes off as well. All right. So that basic design seemed to be a good starting point. One, these are really rugged. Uh, they're going to take some abuse. They have handles on them. They're somewhat weather tight. They're not waterproof like a Pelican case. They don't have the seals around the edges. But we tend to want to take care of our equipment and keep it out of that environment anyway. So what changes did we make in this case? Well, one of the first things we did is that where the hinge, the, the, the top was supposed to lift off, we hinged the top. 
so that the top would open up and stay where it's at. Why? Well, we're going to see in just a minute. And then we totally gutted the inside of the box and made uh, some changes that would make it a workstation that you could take anywhere and set it down. Now, this is one of the criteria from the DIT. They wanted a box. When somebody says, I need to have you do this on our set, we're kind of crowded, or you're going to be stuck in the back of a small truck or something. She wanted a box that was absolutely 100% self-contained. All she would have to do is pick this box up and an extension cord, go to set, and she could be functioning. All right? So let's, let's, let's look inside of this. So what we built inside of this box, or decided to do initially, was to put the monitor in the lid of the box. So when you tilted this up, your monitor was ready to go. And it needed some sort of a sunshade to kind of help it out. So using black foam core and some hinges, we built a sunshade that would block the monitor or extra light from being on the monitor. And up in the top of the case is an inexpensive monitor built into here. And all the cabling running down the side goes underneath to the computer. So a very clean design. And then because this monitor had just terrible little speakers on it, we shoved a little speaker bar here under the bottom. This top was put into here as a writing surface, but also it has some throughputs onto here. So here is the audio jack for extra headphones uh, to be put in here in the top. There's a USB 2 port on the top, which by the way is not generally used for data, but it's used to charge phones. <laughs> it is what it's commonly used to or charging some sort of a device. There's also a little button here that changes keyboards. Now we'll talk more about that in a few minutes. Uh, underneath this monitor are pouches, uh, little zipper pouches that you can get, and they are uh, stuck onto here carrying all kinds of pens and pencils and extra cables. And in fact, the mouse for the case and for the, for the computer is stored up here as well. And then some nifty little pen holders here for your Sharpies and that sort of stuff. All right. So I'm going to walk around to the front side here, and we're going to take off the front of will have access to some storage, but getting into uh, input parts of this unit. So inside of here is the keyboard. And it's mounted in foam, so it won't go anywhere. And we can simply take this out, move this panel aside. And now we have access to the card readers. So here is a couple of card readers. There's a third one missing right here, which is an all-purpose one. And this opening right here is for the LTO tape machine. So they can, can quite literally install the LTO tape machine, and it's, it's ready to go right here in front. It also has a slide-out writing surface. So we can put the keyboard when we're working on set um, or making notes. Uh, the keyboard can go right here on this surface. When you lift the lid, on this, this is where things get interesting. So inside of here is where the magic happens. And we've made a conscious decision on what drives this box. It's a Hackintosh, all right? So it is a mini ITX motherboard in case, as small as we could get it, with a, a system that will run the Hackintosh software so that this is really or appears to be a Mac. Its total, total operating environment is a Mac. Now, many people may say, I wouldn't trust a Macintosh um, because in a professional environment, you can't have the hassles. This one has been bulletproof since day one. It has never given us a glitch, all right? So set up right, Hackintoshes can be very reliable. Connected to that and where this slot is here is where the LTO tape goes in. So you simply undo two screws, drop it in, there's a bar that holds it down, and you're ready to go. These drives can come out, the card readers can come out if they need to replace or just Velcro it in. Across the back is a power strip, distribution power strip. There is a fan in the box to move air through the box as needed. Tucked in over here on this side is USB 3 hub with extra power so we can power other things. 
Another feature of this system is that there is an Ethernet connector between this and the main DIT box. Now, that means that the files that are downloaded on this system will go to a shared storage device like a NAS or an array. There's no more of that, let me borrow that drive so I can download assets. They're immediately shared between this and the full DIT system without all that sharing drive hassle. Okay? Also here is that switch box that we were talking about. This allows the system to share a keyboard and a mouse between two computer systems. The DIT did not want two keyboards and two mice cluttering up the desktop. So by putting in this switcher, we can now push the button that was on the top and this keyboard and mouse will switch between the systems seamlessly. Up here we have a work light and this is just a flexible shaft work light that actually plugs right into this top uh, USB port we talked about for power. Very handy when you're one of those dark corners on set or you're on a night shoot. Give yourself a little extra light. And this bracket up here, that's for hanging your headphones, keeping them stored underneath. The bracket up comes off, there's another Velcro mounting point on the side of the cabinet, so you can have your headphones hanging right there at the ready all the time. Well, a rather fun and unique system. Right, this really meets the needs of this DIT. When they're hired to do just data management, they don't have to bring everything. They just bring this box. Oh, by the way, the box has a name. This is Phoenix. The box it connects to with all the horsepower to do transcoding and processing the files for editorial, well, that box is called Dragon. I think you see a theme going on here. Both of these boxes are Hackintoshes. They run all the Mac software seamlessly. Another advantage is if you need to run Windows, this is basically a Windows PC that's in here. You can dual boot and go into Windows to do what you need to do there. So the decision whether to buy a turnkey system or to build one um, has some questions that need to be answered. So grab a piece of paper and a pencil and start writing stuff down. What's the system supposed to do? This system here is clearly designed to be a data manager system and not much more. Um, if you need color correction and heavy file processing, then that's a different system that you need to think about um, the needs of that system and designing it. Also, the software that you're going to choose to run on the system. Does it run on Mac and Windows? I mean, do they offer both operating systems? Some only run on Windows. That will then dictate the computer that you're going to buy or build. Does it make sense to build your system on a cart? Or does it make sense to have it modular? This could be driven by your production. And a lot of productions, you could put all of your stuff built on a really nice roll-around cart, and it's easy to load on and off the camera truck and roll it up to where you need to go on set if you're in a studio. But if you're doing a lot of location hopping, that cart could be a problem in getting on and off and set and where you need to go. And you may have to go to a modular system like this. What's your budget? You've got to understand that because uh, these can blow a hole in a budget really quickly. Now, building your own can save you literally thousands of dollars and you know the ins and outs of this system and can easily manage and fix it. Now, ask yourself as well, looking in the mirror, how comfortable am I in it with tools and do I have access to a shop to build a system? Okay. While you're looking in the mirror, think about your computer ability because building a Hackintosh is not for a newbie. It's not for the faint of heart. There is some stress, there is some troubleshooting on a pretty low level that you have to do to get it up and running. Once it's up and running, they're very stable. Getting it that, to that point can be very taxing if you're not comfortable under the hood of a computer. We chose the design of this system because of the LTO tape system. It had to have a card that went into a computer. But there's new LTO tape drives that have USB 3, USB-C, Thunderbolt, uh, on them, so that really opens up the computers you could use. Uh, you could quite literally take out this Hackintosh and put in an inexpensive Mac Mini and be ready to go. So that brings us to connections. What connections do you need on the computer and how many to hook up hard drives and hook up tape machines and lots of card readers and different types of card readers? You've got to pay attention to that when you're buying the machine. 
USB 3 at a minimum, as many as you can get. USB 3C, kind of the new Thunderbolt, that's even better because that gives you forward compatibility. Our motto is we need speed. We're going to move voluminous amounts of data under very tight deadlines. So those connections have to be solid and as fast as we can have them. Another consideration is how are you moving this stuff around? Now, if you have a pickup truck or a Sprinter van or a fairly large SUV, you probably have the room to move one of these kits around. But if you've got a little compact car and just a trunk in a back seat, well, that is going to really mandate how much gear you can have, what it's going to look like. You have physical limitations there. I hope it's been helpful for you to have a tour of this unique kit and toss around some ideas about you building your own kit and what you need to think about. And as always, hope to see you on set.